Amen. Good morning. Glad to have you with us today. Those of you online, we're so glad you're following and participating with us on this morning. Would you bow your heads? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for waking us up to another beautiful day, Lord. And Father, we come today to your house, to this place of worship, Father, to meet with you, and Father, to hear your word and to express, Lord, our love in our hearts for you, God. I pray, Lord, that you bless your people. I I pray you bless all that's going on on campus, Lord, throughout the day today, Father. You know every single need. There's nothing, God, that you are not aware of. So, Father, we bring it to you. We pray that you would meet every need today. And as we open your word, speak to our hearts. Lord, we come to hear from you. We come to get a word from God. Not a word from our pastor, but a word from God. So bless this time, we pray. We ask you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Amen. You know, as Elijah said, today we begin a new series. It's in 1st of John. And it's, it's entitled Authentic Christianity. You know, John writes about what it is to be a Christian, what it is to be a real Christian. Anyway, in his days and in our days also. And we're going to be looking at that during this series. You know, I, uh, I don't know if it looks, I don't know if you notice or not, but I, I go to the gym. Amen. Can you tell? You, you can tell I go to the table and eat a lot, right? But I go to the gym. And one of the interesting things about the gym is that there's scales where you can weigh yourself. But one of the problems with the scales at the gym that I go to, they don't work. In other words, they're not very reliable. I remember the first time I got on on the scale, you know what, I was very encouraged because it said I had lost five pounds. And I was, yes, good, good, Vic, doing a great job. The next day, I go to the same scale and I gain seven pounds. And I'm like, what's going on here? Well, then I go and talk, complain, hey, they don't work, we're sorry. I say, well, why don't you eliminate them? Why don't you just get rid of them instead of fooling us? And they say, well, we want them to be a reminder that you might be going up or you might be going down, you know, in your weight, and you need to be aware of that. But I I think my problem is what happens at night. You know, I get home and I, I love nachos and cheese and I love cookies and I love ice cream. And I think that might be the culprit. That might be part of the problem that I face. Can I... Can I hear a good amen to that? But be nice when you say amen. You know what? That reminds me of a conversation two kids were having uh, as as they walked into their parents' restrooms and they noticed they had scales, weight scales from Walmart. And uh, one of the boys tells the other boy as they're talking about this, he says, have you ever seen one of those before? You know, one of those weight scales in your parents' uh, parents', uh, restroom? And the guy says, yeah, my mom and dad, they have one. The other replied, yeah, mine do too. And they asked, well, what is that for? And one of the boys says, well, I think you weigh yourself, but I'm not really sure. Another boy answered. He says, you know, I think you stand on it and you get mad. I think that's what they're for and that's what they have them for. But today we start in 1st of John, uh, Authentic Christianity. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be standing on God's word, the scale of God's word, as we study the book of 1st of John. And I don't want you to get mad. I, I, I pray that we'll end up being very glad as we look at what God's word says about authentic Christianity. One of the things I want to do is I want to encourage you to read 1st of John. It's only five chapters. It's a small book. But I want you to read it as we go through the series. Actually, read it ahead of time and read it again and read it as many times as you can as we go through this series. So let me, let me start off by telling you a little bit about who wrote that book. The author of the book is John, the Apostle John, as it bears his title, 1st of John. Now, John is the same apostle that wrote the Gospel of John. He's the same one, and once you read 1st of John, you're going to find out there's a 2nd of John, there's a 3rd of John. He wrote that, those. And then, of course, the last book of the Bible is called the book of Revelation. John the Apostle wrote that. Now, we know that John wrote those books uh, when he was living in Ephesus. Uh, John probably would have been, the apostle would have been in his 80s, maybe his early 90s. Uh, he's, uh, He's the only apostle that will die of old age. All the others will be martyred. They'll be killed, you know, what, uh, murdered for their faith. And what John, as John writes these letters, John is reflecting and reminiscing about his life as an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, people ask, when were these written? Well, the, the book of 1 John was probably written, uh, according to archaeologists and biblical scholars, between 85 and 95 AD. In other words, about 50, 60 years after uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The, the book of 1 John, and you know, the Bible, the New Testament is categorized into different groups. And First of John belongs to a group called the General Letters, or the General Epistles. And the reason why they're called the General Epistles, there's several of them, they're called the General Epistles, is because they're not written to one particular church or one particular congregation. They were written to the church in general, and these books circulated uh, in that early time, they circulated uh, among the various churches. 
Now, the purpose of John was to remind believers that they can be certain about the truths of Christianity, and they can be confident in their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, in his letter, John explains why he's writing this letter. He gives four reasons, and if you're following me in your notes, the first reason he gives, that your joy would be complete. And there in 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, he says, and we are writing this, that your joy may be complete. It was important to him that they be joyful. The second reason he wrote this book is to encourage them to live a life separated unto Christ, a life that honors the Lord. 1 John 2, 1, he says, my little children, I'm writing this to you so that you may not sin. In other words, that you would honor God that you would live for the Lord, a life separated unto Christ. And then the third reason he writes is to caution them to not be deceived. In 1 John 2, 26, he says, I write this to you about those who would deceive you. In other words, false teachers, uh, people that were already, already that early on in the church, there was a lot of false teaching, preachers that were out teaching heresy, falsehood. And he's going to address that in this letter. We're going to learn about what was that. And then the fourth reason he writes is to assure them of their salvation. Look at verse uh, 13 of chapter 5 of 1 of John. It says, I write this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. In other words, assurance of their salvation. You know, one of the questions that we all ask is, am am I really saved? How do I know if I'm saved? Well, John's going to answer that question for his audience. And of course, the Holy Spirit recorded us for us today, you know, so that we would know our salvation. You know, when you read the letters, uh, uh, they're, they're called the epistles. When you read the letters in the New Testament, you know, they were usually written to counteract some false teaching. They're usually written uh, to deal with heresy, heresy that had infiltrated the church. Paul writes a lot. 13 of the, of the 27 letters in the New Testament are written by the Apostle Paul. And, and most of the time, he's writing to caution the church about false teachers and false teaching. And, and he warns about this. Paul often, and, and John's going to warn about it in this letter of 1 of John. Paul writes, uh, you know, Paul, Paul is, uh, uh, in Acts chapter 20, Paul is, uh, you know, he's shipwrecked. And uh, in verse 29 and 30 of Acts 20, he wants to meet with the, the leaders of Ephesus. He, he, he gets some of the pastors together, and he wants to talk, acts like a little pastor's conference with them. And he writes these words. He says, I know that after I leave, this is Paul, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth to draw away disciples after them. Notice what Paul says. There will be people that pastors, leaders, so-called men and women of God, and their only purpose is to draw you away from Jesus and unto themselves. They're not pointing you to Jesus. They point you to themselves. Listen, there's, that's a red flag. Anytime a pastor points you to them and not to Jesus, right away you know something's wrong there. Because the role of the pastor is to point people to Jesus Christ. Not to himself, not to the church, not to an organization, but to Jesus. Jesus is the center of all our worship. And, and, and Paul makes that clear. And by the way, all throughout the Bible that is made very clear. But I don't know if you noticed, he said they would distort the truth. In other words, they were perverse. They, they, they will say perverse things, some of your Bibles say. And it's the Greek word diastrefo. And diastrefo means they will pervert, corrupt the truth. They will change the truth of God's word. And that's what false teachers do. False teachers, they'll teach some truth. There's some, there's an element of truth in what they say, but there's a lot of mixture of their opinion. You know what? And about stuff that's not biblical, that's not in God's word. They select certain themes to focus on, and then they twist them, they spin them, they distort them. You know what? To their advantage. And by the way, that hasn't changed. We're still seeing that today. You know, one of the first, one of the first perversions of the gospel uh, that happened early on was, was, is what we know in, in history as Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a, was a teaching that was circulating in that early church. You know, and what it taught was that it taught two things. Number one, matter is evil. In other words, this body is an evil. Anything that's matter is evil, especially this body. It's an evil thing. And, and, and the, only, the second thing they thought, the only thing that is good is the spirit. In other words, matter is evil and spirit is good. And, and that teaching had a lot of nuances. In other words, it had a lot of ways it, it, it sort of filtered out, a lot of ways it was interpreted. But one of the most dangerous was that they believed Jesus did not really have a, a real body. He was a phantom. In other words, uh, he, you know, when, when, when people thought they saw Jesus, it really wasn't Jesus. It was, a, it was like a ghost. 
And the reason they believe that is because Jesus wouldn't have a body. Remember, body matters evil. It's, that's an evil thing. God, God, he's spirit. So what you, do, what you saw, when you thought you saw them, they said, you, you, saw, you saw a spirit. And by the way, that's a doctrine that, that still circulates sometimes today in some of the New Age uh, churches. Uh, but, so he wasn't human. He, it was a phantom. And, uh, and, and then uh, the other view was that, uh, you know, the, the, body was, the body was evil and, and the flesh, you know, the spirit was good. So what they did is that they, they, there, there was two things that happened as a result of that. What, what, what your notes say, flesh fasting. They fasted against the flesh. In other words, this is how they reasoned. Since the body is evil, and any urge, any urge from this body must be purged. And the way you purge this body is that you fast. In other words, you, 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 you bring it down and you unplug from the world. And what you begin to see in the early church, people unplugging from the world, just getting away. You know what, going to the, up to the hills, up to the desert, up to the mountains. And there was a group called the Essenes that were doing that. And they were like, you know, m- monastics. They were like, you know, uh, just getting away because you had to unplug. Anything of the world was wrong and their attitude was stay away. So they fasted the flesh, fasted the flesh. The other, the other extreme that they took was what was called flesh feasting. In other words, because the body is evil, you know what, and the flesh is good, you know what, it doesn't matter what you do with your flesh. In other words, they, this other group went to an extreme way group side, and they said, you know, don't unplug, don't unplug from the world, you know, because your body is evil, God knows that, God understands what you do in this body, it doesn't matter, so they unplug from any moral restraints. In other words, do whatever you want, because it really doesn't matter what you do with this evil body, because what God focuses on is on your spirit. What God looks at is what's inside of you. And what happens out here is is no business, all right? So what John does is that John goes to the core of the issue of Christianity. He says, let me tell you the way it is, because that's not the way it is. That's not what Jesus taught. So he wants to remind believers that, that they can be certain about the truth of God's word, and they can be confident in their relationship with God. And then this is what it means to be an authentic Christian. So if you have ever asked yourself, what is an authentic Christian? You know, stick around, come on Sundays, listen to the word of God. He's going to be very clear. So he wants to get some things straight, some important issues. He wants to straighten them out, especially when it comes to the identity of Christ, because these Gnostics were saying he was only a phantom. You know what? He wasn't for real. So so John's going to write this letter about the basics of the Christian faith. And he wants his readers to understand, honestly, what it is to be a Christian. And it's going to answer not only their questions, it's going to answer a lot of your questions. Have you ever asked yourself, am I a true believer? I don't know about you, but sometimes I wake up and I don't feel like I'm a Christian. It's not that I'm out doing bad stuff. It's just sometimes I wake up and are my emotions or, you know, my emotional state or whatever I went through that day before or whatever I'm facing. I just feel I'm not a Christian. I feel God's far away from me. I feel God doesn't love me. I I, I feel, you know, I, I wonder if I'm going to make it. Now, thank God, 50 years have gone by and I made it. But John's going to talk about this in great detail. And one of the things John's going to say is that, you know, you can tell uh, people are Christians by look at, look at their actions. You know, look how they act. He's going to talk about their actions are actions that honor Christ. Uh, you know, what they love one another. You know, not that you have to be perfect. He doesn't talk about perfection. But there are certain things. You know, the Bible says that by the fruit you will know them. You know, you will know the believers by the fruit. Now, now. You know, we're, we're not in fruit inspectors. So I don't want you to think that you can jump to conclusions as you look at people. But I'll tell you what, you can look at people and their actions and how they talk and how they behave tells you a lot about what's going on inside of them. That's not being judgmental. That's just reality. Right? It's like when you go to a, a tree and you want to pick an apples. You know what? You're going to know what an apple tree is. It's going to have apples. Amen. Right? You're going to know what a grapevine is. It's going to have grapes. And, and, you know, some people say, well, pastor, you guys are judgmental. We're not judgmental. You know what? Your tree reflects who you are, what's growing on your tree or what's not growing on your tree. So there's a couple of points that John is going to make, and he's going to make them very clear. And here's the first one. If you're following me your notes, Christianity is a fact. It's not fiction. That's number one. In other words, John's going to say our faith is not built upon a fable, but it's rooted in the facts of the history. You know what? Jesus Christ was a historical figure. And he invites investigation, and you can know that. Notice how he starts, chapter 1, 1 uh, John, verse 1. He says this. He says, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. 
We saw him with our own eyes and we touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. Amen. Now, notice that John doesn't start with the introduction like Paul does. You know what? I, blessings and I greet you and I greet, you know. He doesn't do that. He, he, he goes straight to the matter and he says, Jesus is eternal. He's without beginning or he's without end. And he was for real. And, and by the way, that message has not changed. And, and John has been with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. You know what? And John says, you know what? I personally, I'm an eyewitness. I saw, I heard, I touched him. He was not, a, he, he was not fiction. He wasn't make-believe. It's a fact. He was who he said he was. And I love the way he says it. He says, I heard, I heard. Can you imagine all the amazing things, you know, what John heard Jesus talk about over the course of three and a half years? Can you imagine all that he heard, the teachings, the wisdom that Jesus handed down? You know, what John says, listen, no, 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 no. This is not make-believe. This is real. I heard him. And then he says, I saw him with my own eyes. It wasn't a figment of my imagination like the Gnostic says. No, he was real. I saw. And, and the word saw doesn't mean just look. You know, it actually means I saw, I analyzed. You know what? I was, I, and I came to a conclusion of who he was. And then he says, and I looked at him. It's the word te, de almai in the, in the Greek. And it means just going beyond seeing. You know what? I, 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 I observed. By the way, that word uh, looked at is where we get our word theater from. You know what, I, 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 it's like sitting in a theater and I watched. Later uh, in the Gospel of John, in chapter 1, verse 14, he writes something similar. And he says, and the word became flesh and he dwelt among us and we saw his glory. In other words, John says, it's like going to a movie. You know, those of you that have been watching, you know, the, uh, the Chosen, you know, uh, you've been watching the life of Jesus. Well, John says, I had a front row seat and it wasn't a movie. It was real life. I observed, I looked. And you know what, and we saw his glory. And then he says, my hands touched him. It's the same, words that, the same word that's used after the resurrection of Jesus when he appears to his disciples. And they're like afraid. They're like, who is this guy? And Luke chapter 24, verse 39. Notice what Luke says. Jesus said these words. He says, look at my hands and my feet. This is after the, the resurrection. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So what is John saying? John is basically dealing with this heresy of Gnosticism. He says, listen, guys, don't believe that nonsense. I was an eyewitness. There were many of us that were an eyewitness. And we saw, and he was real. It wasn't a phantom. It wasn't make-believe. And, 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 and he says, I, I don't know if you noticed when I read the word to you. He says, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. You know, and he was from the beginning. Now, in the Bible, the word beginning is used in three different ways. If you're following me your notes, you can write this down. Three different ways the word beginning is. And you need to know that to be able to interpret what John is saying. You know, for example, the Bible opens with the phrase, Genesis 1-1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And what that talks about is the beginning of material creation, of matter. Uh, you know, beginning of, of, of our world. Now, that wasn't the beginning of God. That was the beginning when he created everything. Now, you know, how far back does it go? No one knows. But, 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 what, but that refers to the very dawn of creation. And, you know, we, people have been trying to figure out, when did that happen? Well, nobody knows. Science has suggested that was millions and millions of years ago. We don't know. We just know that the, the, the Bible says, you know what? At the beginning, God created the earth. That's the first beginning. It's the beginning of creation, of everything. Now, you know, science says it's, it all happened with the Big Bang Theory and these gases got together and poosh, and you got all this matter and, you know, what all these planets and universe was created. And, but, you know, you have to ask yourself, where did those gases come from? And, you know, as much as science tries to answer all these questions, you know what, they're, they're, they're guessing. They have no idea. And, and for me, it's just easier to believe God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created everything. That's just so easy to understand. So that's one way the word beginning is used. Another way is uh, in the Gospel of John, John uses the word beginning in his Gospel. And in verse 1, chapter 1 of John, the Gospel of John, he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, that goes further beyond the beginning of creation. God did not come to exist when the world was created. You know, we, we say this is the unbeginning beginning, the beginning that is eternal. You know what, before time, you know, because God's outside of time. This is way, way, way back. You know, and, and, and to try to even try to explain it, it's hard. 
Because, you know, we as human beings, we, we have to start somewhere in our thinking. We, we are finite creatures, and we always have to have a starting point. We have to start with A to get to Z. And, and it is the A which John is describing in his gospel when he says, in the beginning was the word way, way, way over there, before the, you know, the, the unbeginning beginning. Before there was anything at all, there was the word. And the word, of course, is a reference to Jesus Christ. And he was God, and he was with God. That's Jesus. In other words, that beginning is the furthest point backwards that we can go. That's way, way in eternity, and of course, the beginning of creation. And then here, in John 1.1, he uses the word beginning. We proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning. Now, now here, John's not, you know, does not mind either the, the time of creation, or he's not talking about the unbeginning beginning, way before creation. He's referring to a definite time. In other words, when we came to know Jesus, when he appeared into our life and he called us, that's the beginning he's talking about. There came a point in our lives that God called us and we were introduced to Jesus Christ, the son of God. Now he uses that over and over. He's going to use that idea. You know what? When we came to know him, that's, that's the beginning. You know, let me show you where he uses it in, in, the, in this book. In first of John, look at two verse seven. Real quick, I'm going to read these verses. He goes, beloved, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment which you had from the beginning. First of John 2.14, I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. Uh, 2.24, let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you will abide in the Son and in the Father. Chapter 3, verse 8, he who commits sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. A, a certain time, a definite time, a particular time in history. 3.11, for this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Referring to a particular time, not eternity past, not the unbeginning beginning, not creation, but at some point in life, in some point, you know what, we heard and we saw. In other words, John says, at some point we experienced this, and it's been available since then for everybody. You know, and, and, and you experience that when you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And John says, you know, we knew him from the very beginning, the time he appeared. Now, he says this one from the beginning is a person, and he's been seen and heard, and he's, you know, we touched him. In other words, Christian faith rests upon great facts, you know, great acts. You know, they're still arguing. You know, do, do you realize today people are still arguing whether Jesus even existed? And I'm like, that's been proven, and that's been put to rest. But, you know, when people don't want to believe, they're going to resurrect some old ideas. When people don't want to believe, they're going to draw their own conclusions. But John says, no, we saw him. You know, and the Christian faith doesn't, you know, it rests on facts, and it's based on facts. You know, that's why becoming a Christian isn't just a matter of joining a church. It's not just a matter of believing a certain creed. You know, being a Christian or signing a, a doctrinal statement. You know, becoming a Christian is when you are related to the Lord Jesus Christ. When you open your heart and you say, Lord Jesus Christ, come into my life. That is what makes a Christian. When you start sharing and you experience the life of God, and you have a personal relationship to the person, the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's, that's when it starts. And then at the close of his letter, when John closes his letter, 1 John chapter 5, verse 12, that's, this is, that's why he says this, He who has the Son has life, and he who has not the Son of God has not life. It's that simple. You know what? You can be very religious. Doesn't mean you have the life. Doesn't mean you have the Son. You know what, does it mean you're a Christian? You can go to church, you can give all your money, you can pray, but if you haven't opened your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't know the Son. Those are the facts. That's what he's talking about. So Jesus Christ is our fact. It's not based on fiction. It's not make-believe. You know, a lot of people think, you know what, religion, Christianity, it's a, it's a nice thing to have because it teaches you to be a better person. You know, and there's a lot of people that that's why they go to church. I just want to be a better person. Or, or some people go to church, I want to be inspired. I like the inspiration. It's motivational. I, I like that part. Well, Jesus, I, I believe he inspires us. I believe he motivates us. I believe he makes us better people. But Jesus Christ came not to make bad people good or good people better. Jesus Christ came to take us out of darkness and to bring us into the glorious light of God. Amen. In other words, it's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Those are the facts. That's what John says. He's going to get that across. That's what you need to know. And then the second thing he's going to point out in this letter is that Christianity is to be proclaimed. In other words, it's not a private thing. You've got to proclaim it. You know, once an individual encounters Jesus Christ, you can't help but want to proclaim him to others. How many of you that are here today came to Christ because someone shared Christ with you? Amen. Someone told you about the Lord. 
Someone said, you know, God loves you, invited you to church, and they started witnessing and sharing. The, you were oblivious. You were, it was not even on your radar. For some of you, you didn't even care about it. But they came and they told you, and as a result of that, you gave your life to Christ. Amen. You see, because once you en encounter the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what you want to do. And, and he says that in 1 John chapter 1, look at uh, verse 2 and 3. This one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we saw him. And now we testify, and we proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have seen and we have heard. Notice, we proclaim. You know what? We tell you about it. You know, it's the word that, or the word manifest. It's, it's the word that means we, we, we made it visible. We made it clear to you. Since Jesus has appeared, we have announced. And by the way, that early church, man, they took it seriously to take the gospel. They proclaimed it. And, and many of them, you know what? Even if it meant death, even if it meant rejection, and by the way, it did. We declared to you. We reported to you. Then he says we testified. You know, the word testify is the same word where we get our word witness from. It's the it's Greek word martureo, which actually where we get our word martyr. We were willing to speak up and open our mouths, even if it meant our death. Even if it meant we would be disowned. You know, it's a word from the court system, which, which means we bear witness as people that have seen and have heard, and we were not ashamed of it. In other words, that early church was proclaiming Jesus Christ to the world. And they were not embarrassed. I, I believe we have come 2,000 years later where we're not too excited about proclaiming Jesus Christ and telling other people about our faith. You know, the, uh, Peter and Paul, the first apostles, they're out and there's a story in Acts in chapter 4, verse 20, where, uh, you know, where they're arrested and they're beat up and they're thrown in jail and they're released. And they say, we're going to release you, but you better stop talking about Jesus. You better shut your mouth. You know what? We don't want to hear you talking and preaching about Jesus. And in Acts 4.20, it says, for we cannot help stop speaking about what we have seen and what we have heard. Their mission statement is we will share the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, our mission statement is the same, to connect people to God, each other, the community, and the world. So I want to ask you, by the way, I want to ask you, are you proclaiming your faith at every opportunity are you sharing your faith Amen. by the way you're probably going to think i i believe in the holy spirit's going to put someone in your heart and your mind said you know what they need to hear the good news of jesus christ Amen. now here's what some people say to me some people say well pastor vic i'm not i'm not too much about talking about my faith because my faith is very personal it's very private you know what i'm a very private person i you know what and there's a lot of stuff people don't know about me well that might be true but i tell you what your faith is not private your faith is personal. It's a personal relationship with you and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But Jesus wants you to share and to proclaim and to open your mouth and tell people, I have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's changed my mind. He has transformed my life. I am not the same person because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, that is something we have to share. You don't have to be embarrassed. Yeah, you're right. Some people might mock you. Some people might say, oh, watch out with him. You know, he's gotten religious. I remember when I was growing up, they used to call us hallelujahs. You're a hallelujah. Now even Catholics say hallelujah, so they don't call us hallelujah no more. But, but that's what they said, you know. So it's something we proclaim, and, and, and that's what John says. We, we will proclaim it, and we should proclaim it. And then the third thing he points out is that Christianity is shared, not kept to oneself. In other words, proclaim it. And I, I, I already read that to you, verse 3. We proclaim to you what we ourselves have seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. One of the reasons why we want to share the Lord Jesus Christ is that people can come to the Lord, but also so that they can have fellowship. And the word fellowship is the Greek word koinonia, so that they can have oneness. You know, when we think of fellowship, we think of food. Amen. Let's go fellowship. Let's go eat. No, no. The word fellowship, you know, might involve food, but it actually literally means to have in common, to share, to share together. You know, uh, we, have a, we have a lot of things in common. But John is talking about our, our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not only a possession, you know what, uh, of those who share life in Jesus, but it's a, it's a possession that we share with others and we enjoy with one another. That's fellowship. I put in your notes, fellowship is setting, a, uh, is setting aside a private interest and desires in order to join with another or others for common purposes. That's what fellowship is. In other words, we fellowship. You know, when the Bible talks about fellowship, fellowship has two dimensions to it. There are two aspects to dimension. There is a, a, a horizontal 
In other words, we have relationships, we have fellowship with one another, we enjoy it. I don't know about you, but I, ha- I love hanging around with people. And I, I, I tend to enjoy more hanging around with Christian people. Why? Because we share a lot in common versus the people that I hang around that are not Christians. You know what? They do stuff and they share in stuff that I don't have in common with them, so I cannot participate with them. So the horizontal relationship, but then fellowship, there's also a, a, a vertical re- uh, fellowship like this. One another, and then like this, is with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Spirit. And, and John talks about that. And, and by the way, this fellowship should always be deepening in both directions. We should get better. I, I tell you this often. Life is better with Jesus, and we get better at life with Jesus. And what that means is one of the mean, things that means we, get, we, we learn how to get along with one another. How many of you know that before you were a Christian, nobody liked you? Amen. You got along with nobody. Now people look at you, and they say, you're different. You know what? Now you're trying harder to get along with people, right? Before you didn't care. Because that is what happens when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so it's got to grow. Your relationship with one another has to grow. And then your relationship with God has to grow. You know, your fellowship with the Lord, not only with each other, but with him. You know, the early church, the, the church of the book of Acts, they took that very serious. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to the fellowship. In other words, they loved. And I I wonder how many of us honestly can say, you know what, I love fellowship. There are some of you that once the service is over, you run out as fast as you can. You don't want to see anybody, talk to anybody. That's not fellowship. That is the opposite of fellowship. Well, Pastor, I'm in a hurry. I know you're in a hurry. We're all in a hurry. But you know, the Bible says it's good to greet and love one another and talk to one another and share and get to know other people. You know, and and I I, I think it's important that when we get together on Sundays and Wednesdays, I think it's important that we fellowship a little bit. But you know what I also believe? I believe the best fellowship happens when you join a group, like men's Monday night Bible study. You know what, like Tuesday morning prayer group. You know what, show up to the men's breakfast, to the women's event, grief share, merge, young married, single fellowship, and others. You know what, best fellowship, best connecting with people is when you, in a small group, you know, because it's hard to connect with everybody, you know what, with us after church. But there's no, there's nothing like fellowshipping. I remember I grew up in a a home where my parents loved to fellow, every, after every service, someone came out over to the house. It used to bother me because I wanted to watch TV, I couldn't watch TV because... You know what, they were there. The dining room was there, you know, and oh man. We didn't have, by the, back then we didn't have TVs in our bedrooms like the kids have today. And uh, I, I remember that every time people would come over. And, and yet today we're living in days where a lot of people, uh, a lot of Christians want to be Lone Ranger Christians. You know what, I'm going to do this by myself. I don't need anybody. You know what, I don't want to hang around with anybody. It's not good for you. You've heard me say this to you. If you unplug, you're going to unravel. You get away from following. It's, it's like our kids that leave the family and get away from the family and they get lost for two, three years. They, you know what? It messes them up. They get some bad habits. Then they realize, I need my family again. And they come and you're like, Boo, who is this person? You know? And, and you're careful. But we need to, you know, have fellowship with one another. We definitely need fellowship with the Lord. And how do you get fellowship with the Lord? You stay close to him. You focus. You pray. You open your Bible. You talk to God. Amen. Every day without ceasing. And then John's going to go on and he's going to talk about, you know what? John says, I want you to know the joy of the Lord. We're writing these things in verse 4, he says, so that you may fully share our joy. You know, and I want you to think of joy. Joy is like one of those complex words that we, I don't know, what does that mean, Pastor? Well, let me use another word. Instead of joy, why don't you use the word excitement? Excitement. You know, the Greek word for joy is jara. And if, by the way, joy is not the same as happiness. You know, happiness happens when external circumstances are good. So you're going to find you're happy when everything's going well out there. You know what, the husband's behaving, the wife behaving, you know, if you're single, the boyfriend's behaving, you know, your job is good, everything's good, you're happy. But the moment those things don't go well, you're not happy anymore. Because happiness by nature is an external thing. It's based on external stuff. Joy is this, joy is internal. Happiness comes this way, joy comes from here out. It's intrinsic, it comes from the inside of you. You know, when you experience the joy of God, it doesn't matter what's going on around you, your circumstances, your situations are bad. When the joy of the Lord is in you, you say, you know what, God has this. And I'm going to keep my head up, and I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to stay focused, and I'm not going to give up, 
and I'm going to be excited about life and what God's going to do and what God's doing, regardless of what's happening right. I'm excited about what God is doing. Because here's what happens. You know what? You know what? When we say we lose our joy, we lose our excitement. First problem, we lose our excitement. You know, there's a lot of people today that they don't exhibit much joy, even Christians. And yet, with Jesus Christ in our lives, the Bible says we're filled with joy. You know what he says? He says, you know, the word complete, when he says, you know, uh, we're complete. Uh, it means to be filled to the, it actually in the Greek means filled full, which is sort of redundant to us. But it actually means to be filled to the brim, overflowing, abounding. You know what? And when the joy of the Lord is in you, you know what? And it wa God wants to give it to you in abundance. Here's what's going to happen. Have you ever, you know, those of you that drink coffee, I don't drink coffee anymore, but you're walking around and it's full and you walk around, somebody bumps you and it spreads all over. You know what? And the aroma of the coffee just sort of spread. Because you know what, what you're filled of, that is what when you get bumped and you get a little rattled in life, that's what comes out. And, and what should come out is the joy of the Lord. So when life tosses you around, you know what, you're either giving off a good aroma, the joy of the Lord, or you're giving off a bitter aroma. Amen. Nehemiah 8.10 says, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. Amen. You know what, someone has rightly said that if fellowship is the answer to your spiritual loneliness, then joy is the answer to your spiritual emptiness. By the way, God intended life to be lived filled with joy. Now, some of you say, ah, oh, but Pastor Vic, come on, be realistic. You know what, life has all these pressures, and sometimes, you know, we get down. Now, I understand that. But what I'm telling you is don't make the mistake of thinking that the only way you're going to have joy is to be free from pressures and problems because that's never going to happen. Well, Pastor, I'll, I'll be joyful and I'll, I'll, exude, I'll exude the Lord when everything's perfect. That's never going to happen. No, you know what? The believer takes all the pressures, all the problems that you face. And with Christ, there's this wonderful feeling down inside of you that God is at work, God's in control, and I'm going to have the joy. I'm going to be excited regardless of what's happening. And sometimes you got to exhort yourself. Sometimes you got to say, so get excited about you. I know it's tough out there, but you know what? You serve a great God. Don't give up. Sometimes we have to, I, I, I have to do that often. Pastor, you have to do that? Absolutely. I have to do that often. That's what John is writing about. In Psalm 16, the psalmist writes in verse 11, In thy presence is fullness of joy. At the right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So, you know, I started by telling you about the scales. I'm going to wind down. The scales, uh, you know, that, that are in the gym that don't work. And uh, I realize now that they're a reminder, a visual reminder that on any given day, either I'm going up or I'm going down in weight. Amen. And I, I realize I don't have to weigh myself to know that. I, you know what? That weight, that scale doesn't have to tell me. I know. I know if I'm going up or I know if I'm going down, right? Thank God for scales, but I don't need. And, and that's, what, that's what John's trying to do. And that's what Jesus wants. Jesus invites you to encounter him so that not only would you experience eternal life and be able to express it to others, but he wants you to enjoy walking with him. And you know what? I, I entitled the message today, Walk the Talk. You know, proclaim the truth. And I think that's one of the problems. One of the reasons why we don't want to proclaim the truth is because sometimes we're not walking the truth. You know, one of the reasons, one of the things that hinders us is that sometimes, why am I going to talk about something that I am not a hundred or really experiencing or really believing right now? Nobody wants to feel like a hypocrite. And by the way, that's the definition of a hypocrite. Someone who says something, but he's something else. Well, pastor, it's still the truth whether I practice it or not. Yeah, you're right. You're not lying. But people are going to receive it better if they see it happening in your life, and they're going to reject it if it's not in your life. Amen. So that's what John's going to do. And during this series, we're going to look at that. Can I hear a good amen to that? Amen. We're going to have communion right now. I want to have the ushers to come forth, and we're going to, we're going to serve communion. And listen, as we take communion, let's affirm the facts, the fact, factualness of our faith right now as we celebrate communion. You know what, let's engage, like John said, you know, we felt, we saw, we touched. Let's engage our senses as we see the bread and we see the cup, which reminds us of the fact that he, he gave his body. He came in the flesh, died on our behalf. He was raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is coming again. As you handle, as you touch the elements, be reminded that Jesus was real. Not that that bread is the body of Christ. It represents, it's symbolic of the body of Christ, but he was real, and he's still real today. As you eat the bread, taste, let's take together, let's taste together. Let's be reminded that this is but a foretaste of one day we're going to be with him. 
And, and let's be reminded that he is the source of our strength. He is our sustenance. We need him every single day. And I want to be an authentic Christian. And that's, what, that's why we celebrate communion. It's a reminder that we serve the Lord. Would you bow your head? Let us pray. Father God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your love so much, Lord, that one day you send your son, Jesus Christ, to come live among us, speak as no man had ever spoken, do things no man had ever seen. Come and take our guilt and our punishment and your wrath for our sins. And be buried on the third day and rise from the dead. And today, Lord, your church for over 2,000 years has been celebrating a risen Christ, a living Christ, not a dead Christ. Lord, we, uh, we don't mourn, Lord, because he's not dead. He is alive and well. And the most beautiful thing is that he's alive and well in our midst, in our hearts. Lord, and when we call out on the name of Jesus, he hears us. And what's exciting, Lord, is that everything we go through, he understands because as a human, he experienced it all. There is nothing that we go to, we go to him with that he says, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't understand that. No, he understands. Today, Lord, we bring to you our burdens and our cares. We bring to you our shortcomings, our faults, Lord, our sins. And we ask you to forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us with your blood. Lord, as we take the bread, we're reminded that this is real. This is not a fable. This is not a myth. This is not a story that has survived for 2,000 years. It is a reality. It's a fact. And Father, thank you for revealing that fact to us. And as we come, Lord, we open our hearts to you. Lord, there's some drawing that you're going to have to do in the lives of some that are here today or watching. Draw their hearts to you. I pray I ask you this in Jesus' name. Sometimes what we do for most of us, we crack it open, who are you, what do you want? And then little by little, we welcome him and we let him come into our lives. I would encourage you to do that this morning if you haven't given your life to Christ.
uh, after they had had the dinner, the Bible says they went to the Garden of Gethsemane. We went to the Garden of Gethsemane. We were able to kneel at the rock where Jesus knelt and prayed. And we spent some time there. But is that the, is that the upper room that Jesus says? Uh, he stood up and he said, this is, this is the new covenant. This is my body, which will be broken for you shortly. This is the blood that will be shed. And for 2,000 years, the church has been celebrating communion. Our Catholic brothers call it the Eucharist. Rightly so. If it's the word in the Greek that means thank you. We Christians, we Protestants also are thankful that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church of Corinth, he penned these words. He wrote, For I received from the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that in the night in which Christ was betrayed, after having given thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which will be given and broken for you. The bread that you have in your hands, symbol of the body of Christ, taking our punishment, our sin, the wrath that we deserve. Jesus took it on the cross. Let's take it together right now. they had had the bread Jesus took the cup and he said this is the new covenant in my blood drink it in remembrance of me until I come again we take the wine the symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on Calvary for the forgiveness of our sins the Bible says that Jesus is going to come again one day and one of the first things that we're going to do at the supper of the Lamb we're going to have a feast with Jesus called the supper of the Lamb we're going to have communion all believers there's going to be a big table amen we're going to have communion with the Lord he will lead us in communion as he did that night his disciples the wine the blood of Jesus Christ let's take it together why don't you talk to the Lord why don't you offer a prayer why don't you talk whatever is on your heart it's not a memorized prayer God wants to hear your heart by the way he already knows your heart and when you open your heart and you talk to God from your heart you just simply say Lord I'm exposing myself to you I need you so Father God, we thank you today for loving us. Thank you, Lord, that we are not the same people that we were prior to knowing you and coming to you and opening our hearts. And yet, Lord, the reality is every day we struggle. Every day, Lord, we stumble. Every day, God, something happens that distracts us, causes us to lose our focus. And we know it. Father, I confess that to you. I confess all those things, Lord, that are not pleasing to you. And Lord, I pray that you would strengthen me. And Holy Spirit, that you would fill me with your presence so that I can have the, the courage to say no and the strength to say no. And I've come to realize willpower won't do that. I need Holy Ghost power in my life. So Holy Spirit, just fill your people today. We want to say we love you, Lord, with all our hearts. We want to say to you, Lord, that in this world that's getting darker and darker, we want to be lights. Father, help us to stand out and share your love with those around us. Thank you for your love for us. As every head is still bowed, every eye is still closed, I don't want to let you leave without praying for you. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I need prayer, right where you're at, would you stand? And I want to pray before I dismiss you. And by standing, you're just saying, I need prayer. Don't be embarrassed. I want to pray. Whatever it may be. Whatever is going on in your life, God knows and God cares and God says, if you'll let me, I'll, I'll intervene, I'll, I'll step in, I'll do a miracle, I'll do a miracle for you. And uh, I'll, I'll start something in your life that's going to blow your mind. And He will. Father God, thank you for those that have stood. God, there are those online, Lord, that are Lord, also raising their hands and, and standing. And Father, we believe that you are a living God. You know, there's a lot of religious people today, Lord, that they just go through rituals and ceremonies and have no clue about the reality of who you are. I pray, Lord, that you would just shower them with your presence. I pray, God, that your peace, your comfort, Lord, I pray that God, uh, whatever it is, God, that's heavy on their hearts today, Father, they will begin to see relief, Lord, as they trust you and you begin to open doors and give them divine thoughts of what they need to do. Because, Lord, a lot of the situations we face are the result of our bad decisions, our bad thinking. Lord, as you begin to change our thinking, our decision-making process, help us, Lord. Father, thank you for your people. Thank you for the work that you're doing in our hearts. We claim, we claim, Lord, no part in it. It is your work. It is the Holy Ghost's work. It is 
divine work. We have, Lord, we're simply messengers. Thank you for allowing us, Lord, to be voices to share your love with people. Father, touch your people today. Heal the sick, Lord. We believe you're still healing sick. We pray we ask you these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Would you stand? The rest of you stand with me. As you stand, would you give the Lord a big praise, a big applause, a big amen, a big hallelujah. Amen. You know, these days, the Swifties are really excited about what's happening at SoFi State. They're all excited. We have Jesus. We have more to be excited about. Can I hear a good amen to that? Listen, you've been great. My desire is that the Lord would bless you and keep you. My desire is that the Lord would pour out his presence, his spirit, will lift his face upon you and give you his peace and his joy. I want you to leave here today knowing that, you know what, God wants you to be the real thing. Not an imitation, but an authentic follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go in peace. We'll see you on Wednesday at 7.15. We love you. God bless you. Greet one another. Don't race off. Say hi to one or two people before you go. God bless you. We love you.